is uh, um, let's start anyway. We we have let the participants in. <coughs> okay, uh, um, we are recording and uh, uh, we are also on YouTube. Um, great, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, Thursday afternoon here, not so for the speaker. Five thirty in the morning for the speaker, and uh, I'm so glad that uh, that he has consented to come and join us at uh, you know at at a time when we are normally comfortably in bed. Um, uh, thank you very much for for staying with us. Uh, we have been doing this uh, uh, colloquium from April, and now we are doing this every two weeks. This is the last one of this dreaded year, and I hope next year is going to be much better. Let's hope so. Uh, and <laughs> last day of the year, and I'm very happy to uh, welcome. It is our privilege to uh, welcome uh, uh, Professor Bhimsen Shivamogi from uh, the University of Central Florida. Uh, he's currently in the Department of Mathematics, also a professor of physics. He's one of these people who's gone between physics and mathematics several times. <laughs> uh, his PhD was from the University of, uh, um, of Colorado, Boulder. And uh, since then, um, he has worked in various places, Princeton, uh, the ANU. He's also worked in math science in, in Madras and, and, uh, and uh, PRL in Ahmedabad. Uh, and uh, but then he's been at the University of Central Florida since the, the 80s, and uh, and uh, uh, as I said, works quite a lot in fluid dynamics and various uh, um, related uh, physics and mathematics subjects. So very welcome. Uh, very and what we do is that uh, even though the number of participants is growing right now, people are now uh, very wise. They join at the last moment. Uh, normally they used to come like half an hour earlier. So you will see the audience will grow. And what uh, I would like uh, mostly for the questions to be kept at the end, unless there's a very pressing question, please use the in the participants window, the raise hand option and, uh, um, and, and try to keep the questions towards the end. Over to you, Professor Shivamogi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Ray Chaudhary. If you don't mind, I call you so much. You call me Pinsel. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. So I, I want to I want to thank Professor Ajit Kambhari and Professor Soma Soma Krechaudhary for giving me the invitation and 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 Professor Kandaswamy for his uh, enormous assistance with this whole talk arrangements. And so I'm so delighted to be here to meet you remote uh, um, on the on the computer. Uh, so here we go. So let me. The, I guess uh, uh, Sumak mentioned that uh, I was in PRL. Yes, actually, it was a. It was a, a. It gave me a great opportunity. I spent one year in PRL as a visiting scientist, uh, as a recent PhD from US, and then I had a great opportunity to hear uh, delightful talks by uh, Professor Narlikar over there, and I had a great honor to meet him uh, uh, briefly in TIFR in, in 1987. And I want to mention that Professor Nalikar is my all-time role model for a great inspirational scientist and uh, an unmatched, unpretentious person I've met <laughs> anywhere. <clears throat> one, one great person he reminds me actually is uh, uh, Ishwar Sri Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar I used to read in my school books in India. <laughs> All right, yeah. All right, okay, so here, uh, here we go. Uh, with uh, the 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 subject matter of the talk, I want to I want to point out at, at the outset that this whole develop, this whole story that I'm going to mention to you wouldn't have happened at all had it not been for a totally serendipitous encounter I had with the Professor Jean Parker ten years ago in a Astrophysics Forum in Albach, Austria. Inspired by this meeting, I set off on the trail of uh, astro astroplasma physics uh, related problems initiated by Professor Gene Parker. <clears throat> the guidance and encouragement he gave, Gene gave me uh, uh, kindly, so kindly and constantly. I got no idea why he got interested uh, in spending time for me. They were all very crucial. So it felt reassuring to hear from him every, uh, every once in a while that uh, I, was on the, I was on a good track. And four years ago, when I did my sabbatical in UT Austin, uh, I decided, okay, so um, I'm going to do the flagship of uh, uh, Gene Parker's research, which is the stellar wind problem. So here we are with the, with the stellar wind uh, <clears throat> problem. All right. So I, so I thank you very much for uh, listening to me this, uh, this afternoon. So here we get going. And we start with, sorry, something happened here. Okay, great. We got that. All right. So this to start with uh, Gene Parker's uh, 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 quotation from Nature Astronomy 2020. This uh, was uh, this was put soon after the first uh, set of results came uh, uh, back and anal were analyzed uh, from Parker Solar uh, Probe. And then here Gene goes uh, says an unexpected result from this initial um, uh, measurements at 35 solar radii and beyond was the presence of this large and persistent component of a uh, 
plasma flow in the tangential direction <clears throat> in the same sense as the solar rotation. So, uh, so apparently uh, the, the, the probe discovered that uh, the solar wind is going uh, at a tremendous uh, rotational speeds uh, around the sun um, and up to up to distance of 35 solar radia and then uh, gene uh, with his uh, enormous uh, insight into the whole thing he, he, he predicted that this will impact our understanding of how stars the crucial question of how stars lose their angular momentum and this is the issue that i would venture to make some remarks on that i want to thank a whole lot of uh, my expert friends uh, who uh, who, who, who gave me, who gave me considerable amount of uh, advice and input and guidance uh, as I, as I, as I uh, uh, dug my way through this, <coughs> and uh, Jim Parker, of course, being the the at the top. Uh, I want to discuss. Uh, so, guided by this uh, Parker Solar Pub, uh, data's uh, latest finding, I want to discuss the role of uh, azimuthal stellar wind flow and the associated uh, uh, centrifugal driving scenario on the stellar rotation mechanism. I want to point out that until now, the main uh, the stellar rotation mechanism was basically thermal driving, which was proposed uh, in an ingenious way uh, by uh, Gene Parker. And for this uh, purpose, I want to go one step beyond the uh, Gene Parker and then consider the uh, Weber-Davis extension of uh, which is the MHD extension of uh, Parker's model. For the case when the uh, magnetic field, uh, so the stellar magnetic field happens primarily radial, is primarily radial as near the surface of a star, the Weber-Davis uh, slow magnetosonic critical point actually becomes a Parker sonic critical point. So interesting things, uh, interesting simplifications happen, seem to happen. And I want to point out that actually the, the effect of stellar rotation is to cause uh, the sonic the sonic critical point to occur lower in the corona so this this means that uh, solar wind will uh, solar wind will experience a stronger afterburner action uh, like uh, you know aircraft jet engine in the in the solar corona solar i will i will show you that according to the mathematical developments uh, solar rotation uh, 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 seems to lead to considerably enhance the solar wind acceler uh, solar wind acceleration even for actually moderate rotators like the sun i mean as you all know sun is rotating like with the equatorial speed of like a 4000 miles per hour and there are uh, uh, stars in the in our galaxy and in our satellite galaxies uh, magellanic cloud so some stars are going at real crazy uh, rotating at real crazy speeds i want to point out that for strong rotators the stellar wind experiences uh, according to this uh, uh, theoretical development an immense enhanced acceleration in a narrow shell near the star this seems to this seems to be indicated by the by the by the theory and then uh, actually because uh, the, the the stellar wind is going from subsonic speeds to supersonic speeds in the interplanetary space around the star uh, early uh, early researchers uh, um, uh, pointed out that hey this is like a this is like a presence of a, a d level type of nozzle around uh, around the star and uh, that will uh, you know that will some way that will some you know, that will, that can be seen to be a mechanism for the acceleration of the stellar wind flow as the as the wind starts from the from the star i want to point out that uh, all that all the glitters is not quite uh, gold and uh, the analogy is uh, superficial and then it doesn't uh, uh, go it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't hold in detail i will point out i want to show in the end that okay so stellar rotation is going to lead to uh, faster stellar wind flows without change in magnetic flux and uh, this centrifugal driving mechanism seems to enable the protostars and strong rotators to lose their angular momentum quickly. So let me start with a, a little basics. I, Allah, please pardon me if I if I main, mention something too elementary for the audience. I just want to point with this general talk I developed. So I just want to uh, go over this uh, in, in, a, in, usual, in the usual fashion. Uh, as you all know, stellar wind is the interplanetary continuous outflow of a uh, hot plasma from a star and an associated remnant of a stellar magnetic field that pervades this, uh, the space around the star, like the heliosphere in the case of the solar wind. Stellar winds carry, um, uh, as you as you probably know, stellar winds carry a very negligible, negligible amount of mass from the star, but they cause, when they, especially when the star is magnetized uh, and very effective depletion of uh, angular momentum from the stars. And this is very important, as you all appreciate, for a protostar because if uh, it didn't spin down rapidly, it would break up due to huge centrifugal forces produced by the condensation processes in the parental uh, gas cloud. 
And here is a picture uh, of a, a, a protostar in the Orion Nebula that 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 that, that I'm showing you, and then the 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 disk that uh, uh, has given rise to this protostar, uh, uh, according to this uh, um, uh, information, is about 17 times the solar system diameter. That means everything is crazy out in out in out in uh, in, the, in the galaxy. And apparently, as you most of you know, things get even crazier in the, in the large Magellanic cloud. Uh, Gene Parker gave a, an ingenious stationary model uh, for the stellar wind, and this operates on the uh, thermal driving that enables the stellar wind to accelerate continuous accelerate by a continuous conversion of thermal energy in the wind into kinetic energy of the outward flow. And this is a, this is a, a contingent upon the presence of a, a progressively weakening retarding body force like the stellar gravity, and that enables the stellar wind to accelerate. Uh, continuously smoothly from subsonic speeds at the coronal base to supersonic speeds at large distances without requiring a physical throw section because as you all recognize the the space around the star is just diverging so uh, so this is so 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 that meant uh, that uh, uh, the the mechanism for acceleration from subsonic to supersonic speeds uh, had to had to have some very interesting physics and this was the this was the this was the revelation of Eugene Parker but then as uh, most of you know it ran into real heavy it re real heavy headwind and uh, it was not getting anywhere but uh, it, it would have just sat there for a few more years uh, without anybody knowing but but it but it was rescued by uh, as uh, many of you know by professor chandrasekhar who happened to be in the same hallway as uh, gene parker according to the story he went to he went with the referee reports to Gene Parker and asked, okay, hey, look here, Parker, what do you want me to do? Both referees don't want your paper. So well, then uh, do you have anything, what do you have to say? And apparently uh, uh, Gene told him, look here, Chandra, uh, you know, these guys don't have any specific criticism, just general uh, uh, position. So I would I would request you go ahead and publish my paper. And Chandra took, uh, Chandra knew, Chandra knew that, uh, Parker was a brilliant uh, young scientist, so he took his word and he went and published the rest of his history. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, I, so the corona, what happens is, the, as you know, the corona and the solar wind are they're fully ionized because of the huge high temperature and uh, they're very so electrically conducting. So, the magnetic field lines, uh, uh, which are anchored to the coronal base, they will remain frozen in the solar wind. And this leads to enforce, enforcement of co rotation of the solar wind as if it were a solid body. Uh, out to uh, alpha and radius. This is what this is what everybody thought until now. It, there will be a co rotation at, at least until uh, uh, the solar radius, which is like uh, in the case of a sun, there's like about ten solar radii, and this uh, but this co rotation leads to large effective moment of inertia for the stellar wind. Eventually, when it comes out, then it coming out with a, uh, a, 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 a much you know much bigger angular momentum. So that leads to so this is the concept of magnetic uh, uh, breaking uh, and then uh, uh, enhanced loss of angular momentum from the star. And uh, uh, like I mentioned, Parker Solar Observations came out in Nature December December 2019, just a year ago. They indicated that uh, for some reason uh, the solar wind is uh, coupled very strongly with the solar rotation. And uh, so so when the, when, the, when the wind finally escapes from the star, it leads to enhanced uh, transfer of angular momentum. The MHD version of uh, uh, the, like I mentioned, Parker's uh, hydrodynamic model was kind of, was uh, 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 was uh, briefly considered by Morissette and then systematically done by Weber Davis and then further on by Belcher and McGregor. To this will this will this gives us the one a handle over the treatment of magnetized stellar winds. And I want to I want to discuss here the role of azimuthal wind flow associated with centrifugal driving in the Parker Weber Davis uh, uh, model. And uh, this will show. This will. This will. This will turn out to indicate uh, that that the enormous uh, acceleration of the solar wind is going to happen. Um, um, so let me start with a few remarks on Weber Davis MHD model. In the Weber Davis MHD version of the Parker uh, model, the star is assumed to have a monopole magnetic field. Well, there is no such thing as monopole as you all recognize. But then uh, this is a theoretical simplification, and the monopole magnetic field is assumed to lie uh, in, a, in the equatorial plane and depend only on the uh, latitude. For the case of the sun, actually the solar wind pulls the uh, sun's, uh, and if you know sun's multiple magnetic field into an open radial configuration with a few solar radii from the sun, sun surface, this uh, configuration roughly resembles a split monopole actually. Uh, with opposite polarity above and below the helios heliospheric uh, current sheet roughly at located at the equatorial plane of the sun. 
the model uh, this model parker's model, parker webbedoy's model is uh, has uh, restricted to steady state so temporal variability is uh, uh, not considered and also it assumes that uh, the, the 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 system is uh, completely spherically symmetric for a uh, for a th for a mathematical simplification and magnetic field and flow variable so depend only on the distance r from the star and uh, one assumes uh, that uh, the plasma is uh, fully ionized infinite electrical conducting so and then allow and follow a fluid model for the, for which a perfect gas law holds and the gas flow as a, as a, in the in, a, in the first shot it taken to happen it taken to occur under isothermal conditions given by that and i want to point out that the isothermal assumption is really not terribly according to gene parker is really not terribly bad assumption and actually the the soho measurements uh, uh, indicated that the temperature drops only by a factor of 10 uh, by the time the sun in the case of the sun by the time the solar wind arrives at the earth's orbit and uh, for the MH, for the for the MHD theoretical framework, we have equation of conservation of mass given by that, and that if under spherical symmetric constraint, that leads to equation two B as you see over there. And next we have Gauss law, and that gives rise to the next result over there as C. And then the Ohm's law uh, is given by that, and then the, the right hand side typically eta times j the current the, the current density. It, eta is zero the infinitely conducting situation, so you we end up with uh, that. The, you know, that statement over there that you see and this in conjunction with the Faraday's law the right hand side is missing over there because it's a steady situation and when you combine this we get this uh, equation that you see over there 6a and then you break it up into the cylindrical uh, polar coordinates and then that gives us uh, this uh, story this this result that you see 6b <clears throat> near the coronal base uh, anchoring the uh, where all the magnetic field lines are anchored magnetic field is primarily radi primarily radial so which means uh, uh, the the previous uh, statement over there uh, simplifies to the what you see in 7a and then simplify further to 7b now this immediately imp implies that in the space fixed uh, space fixed frame magnetic field lines ex exhibit the uh, uh, spiral pattern and then these are the were famous Parker uh, spirals, and they they were confirmed by the magnetometry data in the in the 60s. And physically, this is due to the near radial dragging of the inter, inter, in the interplanetary space of solar magnetic field lines tied to the tied to the, uh, the, the 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 star by the by the stellar wind. And uh, um, actually, uh, the solar magnet in the case of the sun, the magnetic field observations have shown that magnetic field lines are in fact. Uh, uh, they found to become more and more tightly wound uh, as one moves away from the sun. This is the picture from uh, one of Parker's uh, articles uh, of, the, of, the, of the Parker spirals. And now we'll go to azimuthal angle momentum balance. So azimuthal component of momentum equation, which is you see over there in uh, eight uh, equation eight, and we combine that with the results that we get from Gauss law and the conservation of mass, and that gives us this statement over there. You see, L is the total angular momentum. If there is no MHD uh, stuff going on, then you just have R times V phi equal to constant. That is the hydrodynamic result. And in the presence of uh, uh, MHD uh, 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 action, we have a we have a we have a hydrodynamic component and the magnetic field component to the total angular momentum. So L is the total angular momentum, like I mentioned, all right. And then now we can uh, uh, go back and solve for uh, the azimuthal uh, velocity and then uh, uh, the uh, the azimuthal magnetic field component, and they come out to be that. And you notice uh, at the at the point where M A is the the alpha n Mach number, which is radial speed or divided by the ra um, radial component of uh, alpha n velocity. So at a point where uh, m the, uh, the alpha n Mach number goes to one, this, these this, uh, these two formulas will go will break down unless uh, we demand that uh, at that location l is equal to omega star r r square that you see over there, and then that gives rise to this situation over there. So basically, this implies that uh, you can now you can now take the, the uh, take the uh, the length r a as like a like a lever arm of the magnetic uh, field torque. So this means that uh, the uh, in the weber davis model, the total angular momentum per unit mass in the stellar wind is determined as if it's a solid. It is a it is a it is a in a solid rotation up to at least until the alpha n radius R a, where uh, Mach number uh, the uh, alpha n Mach number is equal to one. And then so using this uh, using 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 this result uh, l equal to omega star times r a square the expressions for azimuthal component of uh, uh, velocity and then and magnetic field there they now they now take this form and you notice uh, that uh, according to the second formula over there 
the azimuthal component is always less than zero for all uh, distances for all r so which means magnetic field lines are actually trailing spirals uh, as you anticipate uh, just just like a thing that you you expect uh, if you had a if you had a uh, if you had a uh, if you had a sprinkler uh, on the on the on the lawn with uh, with uh, with water coming out and then now next go to the radial momentum balance radial radial component of momentum equation uh, which is now given by this and then uh, uh, the if uh, there is a azimuthal uh, uh, flow happening in the wind then you so you see a centrifugal correction to the ex flow acceleration on the left hand side then uh, we have the 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 pressure radial pressure gradient and then uh, the, uh, the, if the 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 gravitational force due to the star, star and then the next uh, it is a Lorentz force contribution coming from the MHD effects. So uh, we use we use this we use we use this in conjunction with the previous results and we can then deduce an equation similar to what a Jean Parker did for the hydrodynamic case that you see over there in equation equation twelve I believe uh, the, at the bottom of the slide. Right now, when you look at this, this doesn't tell us too much what is going on. So to make us uh, to make it to 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 make it look uh, closer to what Parker's equation is, for had a case where Belcher and McGregor reworked on that and then and wrote it as uh, in this fashion over there. So if you take away the MHD effects, uh, like uh, put a VA equal to v, uh, alpha n velocity is equal to zero. And so forth, then you end up with just uh, R minus R star on top. And then in the bottom, you got the two, you got those two factors sitting over there. One, only one of them will survive in the in the hydrodynamic case. So this is the this is the uh, 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 this is the this looks like a Parker-like uh, uh, equation for the radial acceleration uh, for the stellar wind. And uh, I want to point out that the C plus and C minus uh, these are the uh, the magnetosonic uh, fast speed and magnetosonic slow speed uh, uh, in MHD. And then uh, VAR is the radial component of alpine velocity. VAF is the azimuthal component of alpine velocity. A is the speed of sound. And I come back in here. And then notice also, in, in the case of Parker, there is only one factor in the bottom that will, that can go to zero. But for in the MHD case, there are two factors over there that can go to zero. So the, 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 the theoretical picture becomes a little bit more complicated in general. And but I want to in order to in order to simplify this uh, complicated expression, so to to make progress with the uh, with the uh, with the analysis of the basic physics in the stellar wind. So what so what I decided what I what I decided okay take a look at the 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 location near the near the star surface. So over the magnetic field is close to being radial. And that means uh, the azimuthal component goes to zero. So that the, when we come back to the expressions for this uh, magnetosonic uh, slow and fast speeds, so they, they immediately get simplified. The fast speed becomes alpha in radial alpha in velocity. Slow speed becomes just a speed of sound. And then uh, uh, when when this is the case, and then uh, they, then uh, the, the the angular momentum expression that we had here a while ago. Let me take it back. That is over here, right there. That is over here. So when B phi is zero, then that 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 this implies that phi phi must be equal to omega star times r, so which is rigid body rotation. So near the star, the wind is in a, a rigid body rotation according to this uh, development, right? So well, actually, uh, what? So this is basically what this is the this is the theoretical premise. But then, like I mentioned, uh, when the Parker solar probe uh, uh, data came in last December, and it, it and it showed this. Uh, uh, a completely unexpected situation that there are there is a huge rotation of the wind going on at uh, uh, heliocentric distances of about 35 solar radii, not 10 solar radii. The people were maybe thinking in the best situation. So apparently there is a very strong coupling of the solar solar wind to the to the to the sun. And uh, so 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 we 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 take this we take these uh, simplifications and then this complicated equation over here 18 it becomes this simple story that you see over there. So what you have over there, basically, if you drop the azimuthal, uh, 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 the wind uh, contribution over there, it is just R minus R star in the in the top and v a, VR minus v VR square minus A square in the bottom. <clears throat> and that's, that is basically Parker's story. So what happened here is, uh, in this uh, in in this in this in this development, the MH, the, the MHD uh, story gets simplified and what you end up with is uh, something that looks like a complete hydrodynamic situation like you see there is really you know, right now there is really no magnetic field uh, direct contribution the only way magnetic field is contributed here is by enforcing 
is by enforcing a, a rigid body like a rotation over there so this is a kind of an interesting situation so uh, so in the so in so so in the in the in the uh, in this theoretical framework the mhd uh, the only effect of mhd is to uh, is to is to introduce a co rotation of the uh, cellular wind so basically that means uh, once you put in a co rotation we can say goodbye to the mhd so this is kind of interesting situation like uh, 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 like uh, like it it has it has been encountered uh, many you know, in two cases one is in uh, uh, dielectric physics, uh, which is uh, you introduce a test charge in a in a system of charged particles, and then uh, uh, you, uh, the, the 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 test charge is going to attract uh, particles of opposite charge, as you all recognize, and then these uh, uh, particles of opposite charge will go will go towards the test charge and will uh, then cling to it, and will pro and then will uh, 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 develop a shielding around the test charge. So now you have a you have a you got what people call a dressed charge particle. So once the particle is uh, test charge is uh, dressed, then it is electrically invisible outside. So so basically that means uh, the effect of uh, 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 polarization uh, in the medium is to dress the particle. Once it is done, you can forget the polarization. So then it is like any other neutral particle. So uh, and the second example is of course in general relativity, as you all know. So uh, once the once the um, the the mass uh, uh, provides curvature to the to the space time uh, uh, manifold and then uh, uh, once a curvature is introduced then you can say goodbye to the mass and then that it, this led to uh, uh, john wheeler's uh, uh, famous statement matter tells uh, the space how to uh, bend and then and the space tells the matter how to move so this is something along those lines <clears throat> And now introducing the idea of uh, introducing the uh, this uh, uh, this constant of co-rotation, the equation becomes this. You see on the in 23. So uh, along with uh, along with the uh, R term over there, this time we got a cubic over there. So uh, the, the 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 story becomes a little by mathematically a little bit more uh, uh, complicated and interesting compared with uh, uh, Parker. So if you drop the omega there, then you get back to Parker. And then R star over there is it locates the Parker's uh, sonic uh, famous Parker sonic critical point. And uh, I want to point out that R star locates uh, 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 those of you who know it who haven't known it. R star locates the point where the gravitational energy of the stellar wind is uh, roughly comparable to the thermal energy. So there are two that are in balance. Okay, I, so like I mentioned, uh, so in this uh, uh, development. Image effects may be viewed to be included in the Parker's hydrodynamic model in the first approximation by just a co rotation of the stellar wind out to, let us say, the, the, the alpha and radius. <clears throat> now, that the, the, the modified Parker equation, we can call that one equation 23, that can be that to, in order to see what's uh, in, order to, in order to see what's going on uh, in mathematical terms, we can rewrite it in this uh, fashion over there, like I showed in 23. And I want to point out that these variables are uh, as follows, actually. So psi is the normalized R, uh, R over there, where R, R tilde is, uh, is, the, is the new uh, uh, length scale that is, uh, that is provided by the centrifugal effects over there. And alpha, beta are given by those, com those uh, complicated uh, expressions involving gamma, where gamma is the is the ratio of R tilde to R star, which is the Parker's uh, length scale. R tilde is the centrifugal uh, length scale. And coming back to this uh, expression over here, this cubic, it turns out this cubic can be factored into a linear factor and then a quadratic factor. And the quadratic factor gives us gives, uh, gives complex conjugate roots, so it doesn't play any role. And then in a, in the actual in the in the in the in the real physics, so we end up with only a, a single linear factor on top. And then we have a linear factor essentially in the bottom goes to go to zero. So, so in order to have a physically compatible solution, we got to then make sure that both numerator and denominator go to zero at the same point. And so here we are. So the, the Parker sonic critical point now is given by coming back in here is given by psi equal to alpha minus beta. And then uh, 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 recalling what psi is over here according to this and then alpha beta given by that. And then we plug it all in, and then we end up with this expression over there. So the new critical point now is given by this by this quantity over here. So what now we got to in order to make the solution physically compatible, we got to insist that uh, when r equal to r hat, v r must be equal to a, so that numerator and denominator go to zero simultaneously. So equation then leads to a physically acceptable smooth solution. 
the cubic, like I mentioned, the cubic equation over there has uh, one real root and then two complex conjugate roots. So basically, this is the this uh, this is like a this this uh, mathematically reduces uh, to a Parker-like situation, interestingly. And uh, for the case when uh, <coughs> the rotation is a uh, is a very strong, so strong rotators, and according to the definition of gamma, gamma is given gamma is given by over there with uh, with angular velocity sitting in the bottom there in the expression. So that means. Uh, for uh, strong rotators, uh, gamma is small. So that's what I'm saying here. So for strong rotators, gamma is very small. And then uh, the, the critical point is given by that over there, expression over there. Gamma is small, so that means R hat is basically the R tilde. Uh, R tilde is the centrifugal length scale that we defined over here. That, that is given by that over there. And uh, just like uh, R star, like I mentioned, it uh, locates the point where uh, gravitational energy and thermal energy are in balance. R uh, tilde locates the point where the centrifugal force is roughly in balance with the stellar gravity force. Um, so for the, for the case of strong rotators, uh, the critical point essentially is that uh, given, by the, uh, given by this new length scale, R, 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 R tilde. And uh, uh, I want to point out that uh, this, uh, all these uh, uh, simplific my physical simplification that one did uh, to develop the Weber Davis stuff, all those things, uh, uh, they, they, they are a little bit uh, um, uh, vindicated uh, uh, when, uh, when, you, when, you, when you actually consider uh, uh, strong rotators, because uh, as you all know, the strong rotators, uh, they have they exhibit this uh, flattening of the, uh, the stars and uh, this uh, um, uh, development seems to facilitate the confinement of mass and angular momentum loss to the equatorial plane. So Weber Davis uh, seems to be a better uh, uh, model for uh, strong rotators. And then, as you, as uh, most of you know, the strong rotators in our uh, galaxy are Altair, Regulus, Akernar, and all these are uh, 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 flattened stars. And uh, apparently, recently, according to what I heard. Uh, there is a star in uh, the in the tarantula in the tarantula uh, nebula of a uh, large Magellanic cloud and that's rotating at the speed of one million miles per hour so uh, apparently it is uh, rotating every 10, 10, 10 11 hours so it's going like real crazy very close to the 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 breakup uh, speed I heard and uh, as as uh, uh, you probably know this is what I heard it, uh, if you were to put tarantula nebula in our uh, galaxy at the same location as Orion nebula they said that it will be visible during the day <laughs> so that is really a crazy place <coughs> okay i want to uh, i want i want to then point out that uh, for the strong rotators the sonic critical point is given by this r tilde over there and the r tilde expression let me remind you is given by that over there right there r, r tilde given by gm over uh, omega square so new length square describes new physics and that new physics uh, is uh, centrifugal driving as opposed to thermal driving uh, of uh, uh, Gene Parker's model. And then so this, uh, at, at the location of this R, R tilde, like I mentioned, uh, one has, uh, one, can, one can visualize the balance between centrifugal force and the stellar gravity uh, force. So, th so this signifies the dominance of centrifugal and magnetic uh, drivings in accelerating uh, the stellar wind flow for the strong rotators, as opposed to thermal driving for uh, solar type uh, slow rotators. And for slow rotators, gamma is much greater than one. And then, so the so the sonic critical point is located by that over there is basically, basically is basically uh, close to Parker radius. But then, uh, uh, for the case of a sun, even with uh, the slow rotation that the sun has, sun uh, sun does, if we calculate our our uh, uh, the location of the sonic critical point, it turns out to be uh, like not exactly our star, less than what. Parker's model predicts so even for the sonic even for the case of the sun the sonic critical point when when includes the azimuthal <coughs> flow in the solar wind it occurs in the in the corona at a, at a location lower than the sonic critical point in Parker's model and that uh, uh, has a uh, uh, that has important physical uh, physical uh, uh, implications so uh, as I so as I, so so when the when the critical point uh, when the sonic critical point goes lower in the in the corona, and then uh, uh, one recognizes that okay then solar, the solar wind or solar wind is going to experience stronger afterburner uh, action in the corona because after as you all know afterburner is uh, basically putting in the putting in the fuel in the location where the 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 the, the, the gas flow is already supersonic in the in the in the nozzle and then uh, this turns, this immediately goes into accelerating the gases as opposed to 
putting the afterburners in uh, the subsonic portion if, where when, if one did that and then it will only increase mass flux and it will not accelerate the gas so it will be wasted so so when this one this when the critical sonar critical point goes lower in the corona then then you have a very nice uh, uh, the aircraft jet nozzle, jet engine type uh, afterburner action going on and one may then uh, one may then uh, uh, appreciate that this uh, will lead to this will lead to enhanced conversion of uh, 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 rotational energy of the of the of the of the star in directly into streaming energy of the of the stellar wind and uh, interesting thing is uh, this equation over there uh, for the for the for the rotating wind case namely this one over here for the rotating wind case equation 23 it turns out one can solve it exactly so interesting all right and the exact solution for that is is given by that as a matter of fact right there and then uh, we can rewrite it in the in the in the in the in the bottom of the slide like you see over there and and so, so for so there is an exact analytical development for the for the azimuthal wind case and that was that was nice and then i want to i want to point out okay this uh, this the solution that you saw over there it can one can actually one can actually plot it and then what we see is this this following picture before we go there let me make sure that i have covered everything on this uh, this slide well uh let me come back here so you know, well, the, all the 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 curves are, the curves rising to the right they all correspond to the the wind flow and the curve curves rising to the left they correspond to the accretion disk solution uh, uh, that herman bondi originally pointed out and uh, for the uh, the parker solution is given by the red curve over there and then uh, when you put in uh, the uh, rotation of even the small rotation of the sun the curve shifts to the the blue curve as you see up over there so and then uh, the other interesting thing you see is the the, the critical point actually uh, it it is now it is now moves to the left uh, closer to the surface of the star and then so if we go to the uh, so for, for the so for, so even for the case of the sun there is a considerable enhancement of uh, sol uh, solar wind speed because of uh, the the uh, whatever little rotation sun has but if you go to strong uh, rotators uh, like uh, let's uh, gamma equal to given by that and then uh, the the curve the the, so, the the stellar wind speed curve you see over there it like shoots up like a rocket so two things you see number one is a huge enhanced acceleration going on of the stellar winds for the strong rotators and two and this seems to happen in a very narrow shell around the around the around the star come back in here okay so like i mentioned here uh, the figure confirms uh, parker's on a critical point for the sun when uh, azimuthal flow the solar wind is included it occurs lower in the corona than the critical point in parker's uh, model all right okay go to the strong rotators when gamma is much less than one equation 23a that equation over here this one here when uh, when uh, we have fast rotators you can you can then we can we can drop that r star term the thermal correction term and then we just have a r, we, we, we sorry we, we drop the r compared to the uh, r star so we just have uh, a cubic term over there and then that gives us this solution this approximate solution for the for the strong rotators right there for the strong rotators the, the equation becomes like i mentioned it's a, it, it, it is a r minus uh, it is a r minus 1 or r square type of term on the right hand side and this 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 equation again can be solved exactly and when one does that this is what we have and this can be simplified to that and then i would like i mentioned this solution is pl plotted over there in the in the picture and you notice that for the strong rotators uh, uh, two things happen like i mentioned one is uh, the, the 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 stellar wind accelerates uh, 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 fast and then two it happens this whole acceleration seems to happen in a narrow shell close to the star so for the strong rotators uh, uh, mother nature apparently has a completely different uh, radical mechanism for uh, uh, accelerating the stellar winds okay uh, well uh, for, uh, physically one can appreciate that uh, for the strong rotators the the, the 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 sonic critical point actually as you notice is way inside the, the uh, uh, way, way close way close to the coronal base so this seems to uh, um, let one imagine that okay then so the region supersonic region uh, where afterburner action happened because of the coronal heating going on so by that re that reason is after so the so afterburner action really is very strong apparently for the for the uh, strong rotators and this seems to uh, uh, let us appreciate why uh, uh, the stellar winds uh, uh, can be moving real fast for the case of the strong rotators okay and now the i want to give you one second uh, 
All right, give me one second. So now the, 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 so the continuous acceleration of the stellar wind flow as per uh, Parker's model from subsonic speeds to at the coronal base to supersonic speeds in interplanetary space immediately leads uh, one to uh, kind of uh, uh, imagine that, hey, there is a de Laval type of a nozzle mechanism Mother Nature has apparently put into the, the interplanetary space around the star. And so, so this is what this is what probably is happening in Parker's uh, model. Well, uh, the, uh, Parker pointed out, uh, yes, in a, a, indeed, on a superficial level, um, one may visualize. Uh, well, uh, actually, so, but what I want to point out is, uh, even for the Weber Davis case, one can visualize uh, um, an effective de level type of nozzle, for even for the even, even for the uh, the, the azimuthal wind case. But I want to point out that uh, uh, the, 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 this uh, nozzle uh, analogy uh, is uh, not completely uh, is not completely accurate. Uh, like because I mentioned, all that glitters uh, doesn't necessarily have to be gold, and uh, this has to do with. Uh, uh, let me see. This has to do with. Let me. We have first go go uh, go. Uh, those of you haven't seen D level nozzle before the picture this is the picture picture of a D level nozzle over there and then uh, uh, the the middle set of curves are the pressure drops and then the bottom are the uh, the mark number curves and then you notice uh, that um, only one curve uh, represents a continuous acceleration from the uh, subsonic speeds to supersonic speeds and uh, so basically the, this uh, this uh, has to do with uh, uh, the throat uh, the throat happening, the throat section happening uh, um, uh, exactly at the location where the speed of sound is, uh, where, where the speed of the flow or the Mach number is equal to one. If uh, A min is uh, is greater than uh, that critical uh, uh, throat throat section A star, and then uh, you end up with the this curve over there. Uh, the, the, now the the, the, excel, the the flow accelerates in the subsonic regime. But then, since it can get to the supersonic uh, speed at the at the at the throat, it will then start decelerating. So that's a kind of a dud. So, but then only for uh, only for the case when a min when the throat happens to be exactly at the location where uh, uh, the Mach number equal to one, you got you got you continue to have a, uh, uh, acceleration into the supersonic regime. And what happens for the nozzle is uh, uh, in the subsonic regime, the flow is accelerating. Because uh, uh, of the of the of the geometry of the of the nozzle, as you notice, uh, that the channel is uh, uh, reducing in area. So so uh, by the by the conservation of mass constant, if the area goes down, then velocity has to go up. So so the flow, so the actual flow acceleration in the subsonic regime is a, is a flow geometry driven. But in the in the in the once the flow gets to the supersonic case, then according to the equations of gas dynamics. Density drops like crazy when the flow speed is greater than the speed of sound. And when the when density drops, even if the area was increasing, uh, the uh, actually what now? So the flow speed has to uh, keep going up. So so the so the flow acceleration in the conventional nozzle case is uh, compressibility driven in the supersonic case. But uh, something different happens for the for the for the stellar wind that I will I will point out in a moment. All right. Okay. And now, so for, let's let's suppose uh, uh, I, uh, I but now I I, uh, I uh, impose uh, the possibility of a de level nozzle in the in the stellar wind flow, and then I will come up with a expression for the effective uh, stellar uh, nozzle, uh, which has this uh, radius given by that. And then uh, to make uh, what not to get a better get a feel for this one, uh, with, I calculate the gradient of that with respect to radius, and you notice. Uh, uh, when R is less than uh, R till uh, the, when in the in the in the basically the subsonic regime, uh, A star is A prime is uh, negative, and then when R is greater than R uh, R till the uh, in the supersonic regime, A prime is uh, positive. So it's just like so area wise, you can imagine over here yeah, this is behaving like uh, the the D, the the D level nozzle, and they actually what now if you if you if you tailor expand this uh, at the at, at the radio, at the location of the throat. And actually, you see that okay, yeah, there's a throat over there at r equal to r star. You see the in the, the bottom equation over there. And then uh, the two things you observe: number one, r star is less than r. Sorry, r till uh, r hat is less than r till. As that means, in the case of uh, azimuthal wind flow, the the throat section actually is uh, is narrower. 
And the second uh, thing you see over there is that in the defective D level nozzle, because of, you know, there, is a, there is a parameter omega over there sitting because uh, coming out from this azimuthal wind flow. So that is going to make the flare, the flare of the, uh, the nozzle become bigger. So when you put in azimuthal flow, the effective, uh, the, the effective uh, level type nozzle for the stellar wind flow does two things. One is it, it, develop, it develops an error throat and it has enhanced the flare. And these two effects, uh, you can imagine. Then, oh yeah, you know, uh, if you talk to an engineer, it's oh yeah, yeah, that will that means the flow ex the flow is accelerating uh, uh, stronger for the azimuthal wind wind case. Now, what I want to point out is uh, uh, this is not exactly the 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 level type of nozzle. Why? Because um, when we when we actually when we actually look at what happening with the density drop in the case of uh, the stellar wind, uh, this is what is going on uh, near the star. The gravity is uh, the stellar gravity is very strong, and that means well, the, and the flow is very small, and so that means uh, what you have over, it, over there is a hydrostatic equilibrium uh, uh, without the uh, stellar wind flow present in the 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 restricted model near the surface, and that gives you exponential drop of the flow, of, of the density, which you see over there in the picture, the numerical picture of from Lemers and Cassinelli book on stellar winds. So you notice that in the subsonic region density drops like crazy so when the density drops like that even though the even though the space is divergent right so uh, the flow has to the flow the flow speed has to go up so this explains how, why the the flow accelerates uh, uh, in the case of the star in the subsonic regime even though the channel is uh, diverging all right but, but once the flow reaches the flow reaches the flow speed reaches the speed of sound and then you and then uh, then according to the model the, the density basically remains constant so what this means is, for the in the case of the stellar wind, the uh, flow the, the the flow acceleration the the flow acceleration is uh, compressibility driven in the subsonic regime, and it is flow geometry driven in the uh, in the supersonic regime. Complete opposite of what happened for the for the D level nozzle. So so one may uh, one may superficially think that there is a D level type of a nozzle going on, but then uh, in actual physics it is a little different. Give me one second. All right. Yeah. So this is what this is what I said over here. All right. Okay. Come back to this. All right. Yeah. Like I mentioned here, in the conventional naval model, flow acceleration is flow geometry driven in the subsonic region, and it is compressibility driven in the supersonic region. The opposite is the case for the for the stellar wind. So this uh, enables one to get a better feel for uh, the the stellar wind dynamics. So basically, that uh, is bringing me to the end of uh, my uh, story. And I want to summarize uh, by the following remarks. And I want to mention again that uh, Parker came up with the ingenious demonstration that uh, the stellar wind, due to uh, because of the progressively weakening ret retarding body force like gravity, it evolves from subsonic to supersonic speeds, even in a purely divergent nozzle. There is no contraction expansion going on like in a, a standard rocket nozzle in the interplanetary space this all this all happens uh, because of this uh, because of this interesting uh, dominant action of uh, the stellar gravity near the surface of the star and that that uh, forces uh, uh, effect that that forces uh, effective nozzle like action happening even if uh, the area cross section over there uh, is uh, is not at all going down and now, because of the dominance of magnetizing effects or thermal effects uh, away from the star, so uh, one has to one has to, one really has to um, consider the effect of uh, interaction of uh, stellar magnetic field with the with the with the stellar wind. And uh, uh, the, uh, but the, the 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 a useful model in uh, in the in the in the in this research activity in Weber Weber Davis mod, extension of Parker's model, and then uh, uh, I've used this to, with the aim of uh, clarifying the role of azimuthal wind flow in the stellar wind stellar rotation breaking mechanism. And uh, I've shown you that the stellar rotation, according to this development, uh, it uh, seems to cause uh, sonic critical point to occur lower in the corona. So this uh, would then uh, enable us to appreciate that stellar wind will, as a result, experience stronger afterburner action in the corona, and uh, it will make possible considerably enhanced acceleration, even for we saw, as we saw from my curves. So even for moderate rotators like the sun, there is a non-negligible enhanced acceleration happening for the for the solar wind. And for the strong rotators, there's a complete new, completely new ball game going on. This thermal driving of Parker is no longer. Uh, uh, 
uh, what now uh, uh, competitive over there so we, uh, what actually what is going on, what is happening now with the new physics that is based on the centrifugal driving and then apparently that the new mechanism is able to uh, boost the acceleration enormously and apparently this happens uh, in a very narrow shell adjacent to the star so for the well so i, I pointed out that uh, for the this happens because for the strong rotators the sonic critical point is uh, uh, determined only by uh, unlike the thermal driving where the sonic critical point is determined not only by the gravity but also by the uh, the the speed of sound and now for the centrifugal driving it's determined by uh, the only by the two quantities the mass of the sun sorry the mass of the star and then uh, the angular velocity so the so the conditions in the environment like the the speed of sound aren't aren't part of aren't playing any uh, role here at all so that means uh, this uh, uh, centrifugal uh, the centrifugal lens scale is co is basically constant around the the, the star unlike the uh, the parker uh, 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 lens scale which uh, can change from point to point around the star because of uh, different uh, 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 sound speeds, and I want to. Uh, so I, I showed you that actually, if, if one uh, if one uh, uh, imagines the effective D level nozzle around the uh, around the star associated with this uh, stellar wind uh, uh, flow dynamics, and then uh, this uh, and this effective nozzle would have a smaller throat and a and a larger flare, and both of which uh, would indicate uh, uh, an enhanced flux flow acceleration uh, in the in the centrifugal driving mechanism. And I also pointed out that. Uh, the level, the, the the nozzle analogy, however, should not be taken uh, hundred percent because uh, uh, it only does it only does it only maintains some certain similarity, but in in the but with some details like density drop, uh, things happen uh, uh, differently. So uh, the, the 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 net result seems to be that the stellar rotation uh, actually causes uh, tenure, ten, uh, faster stellar wind flows. And this provides, uh, and if you see, this seems to provide an efficient mechanism for protostars and strong rotators to lose their angular momentum quickly. So I'm hoping that, uh, so the, maybe this is what uh, Gene had is in, in his mind when he said that uh, this uh, enhanced, rot enhanced rotation of this solar wind that the Parker Solar Probe uh, 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 detected uh, will uh, uh, impact our understanding of how the stars lose their angular momentum. And then I, my proposition is maybe uh, this is uh, this is this is one clarification, and uh, I want to point out that if, uh, if one wants to go into the detailed quantitative uh, comparison of this, uh, the theory with uh, uh, the stellar wind observations, I just want to point out that because of two things going on, one is uh, 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 difficulty of accessing uh, uh, even the coronal coronal base conditions, along with uh, the along with uh, these. Uh, um, um, these uh, uh, drastic simplifying approximations that one has to do in theoretical formulations in order to uh, get the theory moving further. So um, difficulty of finding, difficulty of doing observations and then uh, uh, difficulty in making the, keeping the theory general, the, these two things together uh, kind of uh, discourage one to make a, a quantitative comparison and then or even to even qualitatively say, okay, all right, yeah, this mechanism is going to be responsible for what's going on. So all these things uh, uh, I would propose, they are just, these are all just uh, propositions at this point. Okay, uh, I want to point out uh, that uh, uh, the story that I discussed, uh, it uh, exhibited only a modest aim going one step beyond Parker's original uh, uh, ingenious uh, analytically, analytically tractable theoretical model uh, to include the effect of stellar rotation and uh, of, and uh, we, and then I, I did it, uh, 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 you know, but now in a first order approximation using the uh, co-rotation uh, uh, constraint. So resulting the resulting form formulation uh, has, a, as you noticed, it has a merit of uh, still being analytically tractable. We have a, so we actually we even produce exact solutions, so it can it, it can serve as a qualitative guide on general principles and then try to provide some physical insights into the into the real physics underlying the, the stellar wind dynamics. Uh, in order to make this uh, make this story conform better with the, uh, the realities, there are a couple of issues that one has to conclude, one has to uh, do. One is uh, 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 re relax the isothermal uh, assumption. So the next uh, uh, level of complication is uh, consider that the, winds, uh, the wind flow is happening under polytropic conditions. 
So I got a I got a I got a formulation going along those lines. Uh, uh, preprint is on the archive, just it is still cooking. So only the preliminary story I got it over there. And the second question is uh, temporal variability. So I mean the solutions that we Parker got and I I, I given we hear they are all good for steady state. The question then arises, okay, so how how stable are these? So I have I have some. Uh, I have some I have some uh, explorations going along the along along these lines, and uh, uh, the preliminary uh, story on this uh, is on the archive. And so that that leads. Uh, there are several other things that one need to uh, generalize and then uh, investigate. And the one is the pressure isotropy. So as a, as a, as a, as, a, as a most of you know, in the magnetized plasma. Pressure cannot be considered to be an isotropic scalar quantity. Uh, it, uh, so the, the 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 least one should do is uh, consider anisotropy. So pressure has one value along magnetic field lines, and then another value across magnetic field lines. So that would take one to the uh, the famous uh, Chu Goldberger uh, uh, and the low model. I I got to mention a great place to um, to uh, to. Uh, uh, read about uh, these things. Uh, the uh, Professor Chandrasekhar's great uh, lecture notes from Chicago, as many of you probably know, a tiny book. Uh, it is a lot of jewels in there. And then we we consider magnet. The actual magnetic fields are all dipolar or quadrupolar, but we consider this crazy monopole thing only because uh, it simplifies the uh, the theoretical development. And so one has to go and then uh, uh, try to relax this. And, the, and then there is this uh, spherically geometric, ge spherically geometric, spherically symmetric geometry that we consider. Everything depends only on the distance r, and so this is not a very good thing to do. And so one got to consider deviations from that. And uh, one one also needs to recognize at some point, uh, okay, what's happening with the details of coronal heating? So there are there are a lot of the stories that there's a long way to go. Uh, so but then this is only a a, a beginning. To so I'm going to. I'm going to end my uh, story with uh, this uh, great uh, uh, inspirational uh, uh, quote from uh, uh, famous applied mathematician Jerry Fitham from Caltech. Uh, he wrote, a, uh, as a, some of you know, may know, he wrote a monumental book on linear nonlinear waves back in, 19, in the middle in the 19, in the middle 70s. And the last paragraph in this in this book, he uh, he he makes these remarks. And uh, this is uh, he's talking about this chapter on not the the latest uh, discussion of latest uh, 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 developments in nonlinear uh, evolution equations and soliton solutions and those things. So he says, in concluding this chapter, one can only comment on the remarkable ingenuity of the various investigators involved in these recent developments. The results have given tremendous boost to nonlinear phenomena in general. Doubtless, much more of value will be discovered. Not least is the lesson. This is what Jerry Vitam loved, and I like that too. Not the least is the lesson that exact solutions are still around. They're not gone yet. So that means one should not turn too quickly to a search for the small parameter, because in the 70s, perturbative techniques uh, were something which uh, kind of uh, dampened uh, uh, Puritans like uh, Vitam. So he was discouraging people to jump into the uh, perturbation stuff too quickly. And uh, but then uh, in the now in the, over the last 20, 30 years, as you know, this computer is has, is a is a similar threat to the analytics uh, as perturbation stuff was in the in the in the in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, I guess. So not the least is the lesson that exacerbations are still around, and one should not always turn too quickly to a search for the small parameter epsilon, or I added in the bracket computer. So I want to thank you all for your. Uh, enormous generosity and and uh, and and uh, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, collegial gesture to give me the invitation to come and do the talk and I so delightful about this uh, opportunity and uh, I want to end my show and uh, uh, request thank you again for your patience uh, and then request you to ask me questions and I will try to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vincent. I mean, I, uh, this was a, a very fascinating talk, and I'm sure people will have questions. I'm requesting everybody to um, <clears throat> to unmute the, to raise your hand in the uh, in the participant window, and I'll ask uh, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. Meanwhile, while we're waiting for this, can I ask you one thing? I mean, I, you mentioned uh, Chandrasekhar's famous book on elliptical figures, 
And here you also showed that if, if things are moving this fast, like 600, 700 kilometers per second, they will be significantly flattened. So the exact solutions that you use, are yeah. you using ellipsoidal coordinates at all or are you still in no. the Actually, the, you know, the, this, this is only providing a qualitative justification for assuming that uh, all the interesting things are happening in the equatorial plane. Right. Because most of, the, most of the mass and momentum flux is uh, uh, the, the mass and the magnetic field, uh, 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 the, the variables, they are concentrated uh, uh, in the uh, equatorial plane. So this Weber, this Weber Davis uh, uh, assumption, it seems, uh, it seems, uh, it seems a, a better representation for the strong rotators than for ordinary rotators. Because right. So you take a plane, meridional plane or equatorial plane, and, and yeah, so the, the dynamics is the dynamics is all on the plane. Yeah. Thank so you. Great. so Thank yeah, you. only in that only in that sense, uh, uh, the uh, strong rotators kind of come to the rescue for Weber Davis uh, uh, restriction. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Kandu. Go ahead. You you can ask your question. Yeah, uh, Bimson, thanks a lot for your. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for all. Thank you for all the uh, all the all the enormous uh, uh, details with arrangements and everything. I can't thank you enough to make uh, the no, talk no, happen no. here nicely. That's fine, but you have to get up at five thirty. <laughs> oh yeah, but it's okay. You know, I set the alarm, but I never used it though. When you're thinking about it, then I guess well, you know, wake up. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I, ask you a question. I, mean, I, think I wanted that, to ask you that uh, basically at some stage you lost the magnetic field because you seem to have made an assumption that everything is co-rotating. That's it's right. You know, see what, so basically what you so know, the argument is... Uh, fast, okay. Can you just go back to that? How yeah, do you yeah. lose the magnetic field? This is what happened. Give me one second. Right there. So you see, near the stellar surface, B phi is zero. So that means V phi has to be equal to omega star r. So that means, uh, so that means uh, the, the 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 wind is in a co-rotation with the star. Right, you but I thought I mean? far away from the stellar surface, the B phi is not zero because that's a this is no good spiral. Absolutely. So, so this is only good near the near the surface of the star where magnetic field lines are essentially radial. But uh, then your solution breaks down far away from. Oh the yeah, I mean, as you all, as you know, you know, a lot of these. I mean, most of the theoretical developments they don't they don't hold for you know everywhere. They are not global representations. They are all they are all good only in in a, in certain well defined regions. You see what but, I mean? Yes, but you should be able to have a co rotation at least until some alpha in radius or something, right? Yeah, it be, that's what you know. That's what everybody thought until the uh, the Parker solar probe data came last December. Everybody thought that okay, this is probably good until so you know uh, alpha in radius, but which was like a, about a ten uh, solar radii. But then uh, Parker uh, solar probe uh, uh, measurements uh, they indicated oh this is not just good for ten, but thirty five solar radii. I see. So, but do, you, do you then explain that, or you don't explain that? Well, this is just like a, this is just like Einstein's story, uh, special relativity. You see what I mean? So, as you all know, uh, Michelson Mole experiment came and then uh, uh, pointed out that there is no such thing as ether. All right. So they he cannot find it. They cannot find it. So well, everybody then you know, as you know, everybody was you know in Europe, Lawrence, Fitzgerald, all these guys were uh, frantically trying to come up with ad hoc explanations you know uh, uh, how this can how this can how this can happen but uh, einstein was not interested in in uh, in resuscitating the old ideas he said forget everything you just forget everything you just uh, you just start with the new new uh, story that there is no ether and then so that means then they didn't have to do any of this crazy uh, uh, you know uh, co uh, uh, length contraction time dilatation all this crazy stuff they don't have to do any of those so I guess, you know, so, uh, so you kind of release one from, uh, you know, doing all those uh, crazy concoctions and then enable one to go directly attack uh, uh, what's happening. But then Einstein never explained why there is no ether. You see what I mean? So he said, that's for you guys to, uh, to deal with. All that, I, all that I want to do is start with the premise, there is no ether. So, all right, the rest is, uh, rest, rest is uh, the story that, that I'm giving you. So... Uh, um, I would propose uh, that we, we will talk about things in a similar sense. Here I say, okay, all right, there is going to be there is going to be co-rotation, all right? Okay, all right. Then uh, how exactly the co-rotation happened, all the details, I leave it to the other gang. 
Right, so you are assuming co-rotation in the solution and then getting everything else. Well, I'm not completely assuming because it's, it's, it's given by the equations of MHD anyway. So only once- uh, Only near the stellar surface, not everything. That's right, that's right. Once, 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 uh, once, I, uh, once I got that from the MHD equations, then I say, okay, all right. Yeah, the Parker story, the Parker solar probe has now shown that this is good for not just 10, but 35 solar radius. So, okay, so then we can go and do it at least until, and at least beyond uh, 10 solar radius. Okay, thanks. Thank you. No problem. Does anybody have any, any other questions? I didn't see any other hands up. This is your last chance. <laughs> last chance of the year. <laughs> People are already yeah, that's right. <laughs> December 31st. <laughs> to ask a question in the colloquium. Anybody else? Just waiting. I, I don't know. I'm not, uh, I don't have the YouTube window in front of me. I don't know whether there are questions there. Mm. But uh, um, if uh, uh, Indulekha has her hand up, Indulekha, go ahead. Indulekha, please go ahead. I've just unmuted you. Yeah, it is too tempting that offer of the last question of the year. <laughs> <laughs> last chance. <laughs> this, this, this comes from the observational side, uh, this radial nature of the uh, magnetic field. Like, uh -huh. if, if you are, I don't know whether the flare field would have the same kind of uh, geometry, uh, but uh, Zeeman effect is supposed to produce a broadening of the Balmer lines uh -huh. uh, in flare fields. So, and uh, I think along and across the field, uh, the Z-man effect is different. Mm -hmm. so would that be a way of tracking uh, the field geometry? Well, you know, as, in, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this, this, this whole development is uh, severely restricted by this uh, spherical, sp sp spherical symmetry assumption. You see what I mean? So actually, when you talk about solar flares and and then uh, dynamics near the coronal holes, as you as a, as a, most of you know, <clears throat> that the, the the spherical symmetry assumption is a very bad thing near those near those over there, because uh, the expansion is no longer uh, uh, radial; it is super radial, according to according to what people know. So this whole spherical symmetry assumption is uh, is no good for. Uh, for uh, uh, talking about uh, de quantitative details of uh, what ha what happens near coronal holes, and uh, where people also tend seem to think that flares happen. Oh, the the field is not strong enough to produce any effect. Oh, I remember reading something about looking at the polarization at the two edges of the line, and um, well, you know what. Yeah, you know, you know what, what? All that I can say is, uh, near coronal holes, this spherical symmetric assumption is uh, is known not to be good. So then, uh, actually, one has to deal with uh, deal with uh, uh, super radial uh, uh, geometry. So so that means uh, that means uh, it is it's one one cannot write uh, the conservation of mass equation like uh, rho times v times r square equal to constant. So it's going to be r to the power two plus something num something else. It's super radial. Okay. So, Thanks. Yeah. So, I think what, what, what is being said is that that particular observation can't be actually addressed by this formalism. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is this only, like I mentioned, this, this whole thing is a, a one step beyond Parker, and then this is only good to uh, get a qualitative uh, uh, idea about, okay, what is a stellar rotation going to do to the acceleration of stellar winds? Okay, next, oh. uh, let's go on to the next question, Dipankar Bhattacharya. Hello. Is, Hello. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very then, much. Uh, my question was related to angular momentum loss in stellar wind. Mm -hmm. Magnetic is a <clears throat> major factor in the evolution of stars. Mm -hmm. And uh, given the fact that I, that we have this new uh, Parker observation and uh, the solutions that you have now produced, mm -hmm. does it predict that <clears throat> given the stellar winds that we know from uh, stars in general, mm -hmm. that the angular loss rate that we normally assume needs to be revised? Oh, 
Well, yeah, of course. You know, if you if you are not taking into account the effect of stellar rotation on these winds, then you have to revise because absolutely because physical mechanism is no longer uh, thermal uh, like in Parker's model, but it is centrifugal. So, do do you have some idea by what factor this revision might be? Uh, I cannot give the numbers, but as you see, as you saw from my from my from my uh, solutions, the uh, the 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 acceleration of the stellar wind uh, it happens rapidly and then happens in a uh, um, very narrow region near the star. So it is it is it is it is really a a very strong accelerator. So I can only I can only I can only I can only talk things in qualitative terms. But unfortunately, uh, I'm not I'm not uh, 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 inclined to put numbers. Okay, Sorry, but only for strong rotators, right? I mean, not for yeah. not for the sun. But actually, like I, like <clears throat> like you saw from my solution, even for the sun, when rotation is considered to be so small, the uh, the the uh, enhancement of acceleration of the solar wind is not is not negligible. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, stellar rotation is a. Uh, is a is a is a strong player. Um, Somak, I have a question. Let's go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, Thank uh, one you. One comment for uh, for Indulekha that we cannot measure coronal magnetic field as yet uh, with that mm -hmm. entity, so that would not be possible to make any diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, secondly, a question. Um, so, does it uh, your model also? So uh, distinguishes between um, uh, fast solar wind and slow solar wind, and uh, uh, can you say anything about uh, about that? That the, I mean, the fast one coming from coronal holes, but uh, that's right. Slow solar wind has a very different origin. That's right. Um, no, the, yeah, the, I guess you know my story is a, is a, I think is more accurate for the slow solar winds. Fast solar winds, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they are super radial. <coughs> Right. So, um, I mean, one that has to also then think about that how actually if the slow solar winds are coming from helmet streamers are uh, are the boundaries of the active region, then one has to think about putting plasma into those magnetic field and opening it up. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in coronal hole, you have a sort of um, quote unquote uh, open field lines. So there the plasma is right. into that. So mm -hmm. um, how would you take that into account when you extend your model uh, further? Oh, I mean, extension of extension of the story for the for the the, the fast winds uh, near coronal holes is uh, <clears throat> we got to 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 go generalize the consideration of mass constraint and and then uh, uh, start the story from scratches. Hmm. So this is only good for uh, radial uh, uh, winds. The super radial things we got to start uh, cleaning it up from the beginning itself. You see what I mean? And then you know there are there are also a lot of things uh, that that the theory doesn't uh, include like uh, sources or sinks of uh, uh, of the uh, of, of plasma in the in the in the system. Right. So this is a this is this is a this is just a one step beyond Parker and unfortunately uh, it is not able to it is not able to right now uh, anyway um, uh, go uh, connect with a lot of. Uh, observational details yeah thank you yeah, my pleasure <clears throat> uh, somak you are muted somak yes indulekha really wants to ask the last question so indulekha again i've unmuted you <laughs> go ahead yeah i just wanted to know there are these uh, uh, observations on stellar clusters where they say the uh, uh, main sequence is broadened due to fact that there is differential stellar rotation rather mm -hmm. than um, you know uh, a, a delta yeah, in the rotation. Mm -hmm. yeah. so uh, would you have any comment regarding that you know stars in the same cluster having different rotation rates this is in uh, that's right it, it complicates it complicates uh, it complicates introducing rotation uh, altogether you know so then we have to come up with appropriate models for uh, 
difference in rotation and then uh, uh, and then uh, modify this uh, development to uh, reflect them you see what i mean mm -hmm. so then instead of instead of omega star uh, instead of taking omega star to be a constant for the whole star uh, uh, for stellar surface then we got to put in uh, some models for uh, uh, the spatial variation of uh, omega star okay you see what i mean so i guess in principle in principle it could be it could be dealt with uh, but uh, because uh, i haven't looked at the details i'm not i'm not i'm not able to uh, say exactly okay what happens okay thank you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great so if, if there are no other questions uh, uh, thank you very much again my for pleasure your, your i i and appreciate the invitation <laughs> and i thank you all for giving me such a great audience and and the encouragement yeah, and support discussion. thank it you just feels